couldn't do it. I held her and she was shaking and she was dying in my hands. She was looking at me, I was looking at her, and I had like a spiritual experience. I felt her pain, I felt her life slipping from her body. Her blood was my blood, her fur was my hair, her eyes were my eyes. Wow. And in that moment I said to myself, well if I can't take the life of this animal, but I pay other people to do it for me, for my meals, I'm a fucking hypocrite. <laughs> Okay, so it's with great pleasure for me to introduce to everyone Robbie Lockie, a good friend of mine. Now, Robbie, you are a vegan campaigner, creative director, and the co-founder, most notably the co-founder of Plant Based News, very big news platform, one of the biggest online. Now, if you like, for me, I didn't know who Robbie was for a long time. I'd say a few years uh, into PBN, I thought there was only one founder, Klaus. Klaus is probably the most uh, person who's on camera the most but there was Robbie in the background doing a lot of work in the animal rights movement and we only got to know each other personally probably about a year ago I'd say mm -hmm. Robbie for those of the for the people who don't know who you are can you start off with your story your philosophy how you led into veganism your transformation your philosophy on an outlook on life how did you become such a compassionate spiritual human being thank you great to be here Joey um, so it all started about six and a half years ago um, I went on a, a bit of a journey of discovery mainly for health reasons um, I didn't know what veganism was I'd never heard of a vegan I knew what a vegetarian was. I, have, um, I mostly found vegetarians really annoying people, you know, I thought they were just fussy people mm -hmm. and I never even thought about, you know, what people ate uh, in, a, in an ethical perspective. Um, but I had, at the time I had a lot of health problems like joint problems, bloating, skin problems, rashes, uh, I had issues with low energy and I just was I'm really, really unwell and um, I saw loads of doctors and saw loads of different people, different like health practitioners and no one could really tell me what was wrong with me. And at the time, I just started getting into Netflix. It had just started. Um, and I watched Forks Over Knives, Food Inc., Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead by Joe Cross. And I really began to sort of like fill my mind with all this information about nutrition and the food system and how um, animals were reared. And I, I was kind of quite shocked by what I was learning. Um, and I decided to take my own health into my own hands. And I started being told about these alkaline diets, which is essentially just eating more greens. Mm. And I started juicing every morning and um, introducing more green vegetables into my diet. And then I decided to do a seven day juice fast. And that was five different juices every day for seven days. I had to make them all myself as well, mm. which was quite a task. I had to get up super early in the morning at like five and make them all. Um, and I remember being in the supermarket and the, the, the checkout lady was like, what the hell are you doing with so many pineapples? Wow. <laughs> Just piles and piles yeah. of fruits and vegetables. And got through it and I started to feel really light and full of energy and my, my health really started to improve after one week. Um, and then at the end of this whole process, I went to a pub and I sat down and I ordered a big greasy beef burger. Uh huh. And I got halfway through it and I felt really, really sick. Wow. And I think that was the moment I started to fall out of love with eating meat. Mm -hmm. And I really began to question, why am I eating this stuff? I don't enjoy it anymore. After just one week wow. of eating fruits and vegetables. Um, and what happened after that was really, really interesting. I was told about earthlings. Mm -hmm. And I watched the film and I was quite shocked by what I saw. I mean, it was weird for me because I grew up on a farm, I've seen animals killed, but I never made that connection between animals as individuals and the suffering they experienced and our food choices. And I watched the film, turned the TV off, and I was just wandering around the house in, in a bit of a daze, really shocked and confused about why I hadn't thought of this stuff before. And just by pure chance, unfortunate chance, our next door neighbour... Um, ran in, ran over the other neighbor's cat right in front of our house, this beautiful white Persian cat. And she was lying on the road in front of our house, the lady in the car with her kids a few paces up. She was screaming and crying, the kids were crying. And I went up to her and I said, what's happened? And she said, oh, the cat, the cat, can you go and help the cat? And the cat was just there on the, on the, on the um, tarmac in this big pool of ruby red blood, flapping around and obviously in pain, dying. She'd you know, been smashed, smashed up by the car. And you know, people always say, you should put an animal out of its misery mm -hmm. if it's suffering, mm -hmm. right? I couldn't do it. I held her and she was shaking and she was dying in my hands. She was looking at me, I was looking at her, and I had like a spiritual experience. I felt 
her pain, I felt her life slipping from her body. Her blood was my blood, her fur was my hair, her eyes were my eyes. Wow. And in that moment I said to myself, well, if I can't take the life of this animal, but I pay other people to do it for me, for my meals, I'm a fucking hypocrite. Wow. And I thought about all my Buddhist philosophy and practice and everything I've been learning over the last 12, 13 years, and I thought, there's no way I can continue with my life eating and consuming animals. Um, be Buddhist and be talking about kindness and compassion yet I'm sitting down to a, what is essentially a plate of violence three times a day and in that moment I became a vegan <laughs> wow I had my hair is standing up on my arms and I'm tearing out my eyes I did not know that I did not know your vegan story and you know it kind of freaking me out while you're saying it because it's very it's eerily similar to mine uh, you know I um I did the juice fasting after becoming overweight. There was a period of suffering mm. and I uh, did the raw foods, the juice fasting, lost a lot of weight, had this amazing energy. It was, it's really similar. And then I, and then I got involved with the ethics. It's almost like I had to wake up, get involved with the ethics and find the animals side mm. of it. But it's, it was all like a, a progression mm. of suffering, pulling myself out of that suffering and then realize that other animals were suffering too. Do you see this much in the movement? What do you think that is? Do you think it's this spiritual awakening people are having, are having or do you think it's something more grounded? I'd like to say that it's a spiritual thing. I mean, I'm a Buddhist and mm -hmm. I am a spiritual person, but I'm also a rational person and I feel like I, my world is heavily grounded in science and what, what is tangible. Yep. Um, I think that, you know, if, it, if that was the case, every time people went vegan or, or stopped eating animals, you would be, all the vegans around you would be kind, compassionate, gentle, loving people, but they're just not, you know, okay. and that's, I'm, you know, sorry to break anyone's like uh, <laughs> fantasy <Yeah>. about, Evolution. <laughs> religions about what be vegans are, but there's a lot of very aggressive, um, angry, um, misanthropic and hateful vegans out there. Yeah. V being vegan doesn't make you a kind, compassionate person. It just means that you're a person who's decided that animals don't deserve to be exploited and abused for their bodies, for their leather, for their eggs, for their milk, or whatever. You know, that's a choice you've made. Yeah. It doesn't absolve you from being, or it doesn't stop you from being a, an angry person. So that being said, I do think meat could have certain biological uh, components that may cause people to be a bit more aggressive or a bit more kind of um, angsty, maybe. But What it's, are they? I mean, things like adrenaline, maybe. So if an animal, cortisol, or? cortisol, adrenaline, these kind of substances, you know, I don't know unless we actually test meat. Yeah. I don't know how much of those substances remain in the meat mm. after it's been but animals been butchered and it's been cleaned and processed and stuck in a supermarket. Wow. It's possible, but we'd need to do like you know tests on the on the products to see on the on the products on the meat on the flesh. Yeah. To see if uh, they're there. Interesting. Yeah, because like being a vegan doesn't mean that you are like this compassionate person in all areas of your life. It just means you oppose something that is inherently cruel, yeah. unnecessary and abusive. It's like I'm opposed to child abuse. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm. the sun now shines out of my ass. It just means I don't do something that's really cruel and unnecessary. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be this amazing person in all aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the collective suffering that vegans uh, undergo after witnessing what's happening to animals and being met with ridicule? Do you think that's fueling the hatred? From non-vegans? Do you think that's fueling the anger that, that vegans have? You know, they're, they're, they're facing what's going on to animals and they're met with ridicule from non-vegans and people that are still eating yeah. meat. Do you think that fuels the anger? I think it does. I think you and I talked about it on the phone a few months ago about how it's very easy to react with anger when yeah. anger is given to you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when people react with anger about our lifestyle, it's nothing to do with us. No. It's yeah. all because they don't really understand yeah. where we're coming from. We're on the other side, I like to use the metaphor of a glass panel, yeah. and it's frosted. And we're now on the other side. We're banging on that panel, trying to explain to them what's going on. No matter what you say, no matter what signs you pull, no matter yeah. what words you use, they cannot hear you. Yeah. And you can get angry and you can scream and you can shout, but they don't understand you. And no matter what words you use, they're not going to listen yeah. unless you do something that's going to lower the blind mm -hmm. and lower the defenses yeah. and you can get in. Yeah, I get you. You know, so anger and frustration at people who think that we're crazy is counterintuitive. Yeah. It's only, in my opinion, it only pushes people further away. Mm -hmm. And even though you want to get angry and you want to shout and scream at people, 
because you want them to listen because you can see you've been in a slaughterhouse you've been yeah. on a factory farm you've seen these beautiful as we both often describe childlike beings yeah suffering of course you're angry yeah but we have to as advocates put that anger aside for a second and think about what's effective rather than what's you know like an outlet <laughs> yeah it's like, hard though yeah it is hard and i don't blame um vegan activists for being no. angry because i get my fair yeah. share of vegan activists yelling at me and you know calling me plant-based you're not vegan you know all yeah. these things and uh you know directing their anger towards me i know that they're suffering their own vicarious trauma from what they've seen and what they've witnessed in the animals they've tried to save and they've seen all this uh suffering they're constantly fighting you know debating and yeah, defending yeah. themselves and so i understand i try to take myself out of the picture and but you know i am you know you know i'm no saint when it comes to directing aggression at people mm -hmm. I, i've still got to really be mm -hmm. mindful of that i come from a different background and past to you being a buddhist that sort of you you've developed these skills before you were a vegan um so Talk about your philosophy with your Buddhism and how that's helped you with your vegan advocacy. You're just day to day do, dealing with aggressive people, mm. dealing with this battle, because it is a battle, isn't it? I think what it's taught me, my Buddhist practice has taught me, is to accept the things I cannot change. Wow. There's no point in feeling upset or anger because someone is reacting to you in a way that you don't like. Yeah. Because you have no control over them yeah. at all, especially online. Yeah, wow. Well. You know, there's no point in in, in a, reacting in an aggressive way. Mm -hmm. When people are aggressive to me online, I often respond with politeness and kindness and and uh, and wow. positive positivity. I never ever lose my temper. Mm -hmm. I never get aggressive. Obviously, now I mean, in the past I have done. You know, because I but in now in my kind of my you could say my Buddhist years, I've learned to be a bit more, well, a lot more composed. Yeah. Because I've realized that actually when I've reacted with anger or I've lashed out at people, I mean, it's so obvious. You see it straight away. As soon as you lash back at people, they lash back at you and then it just turns into this mudslinging match and, and you know, everyone loses. Really. Yeah. So it's helped me to be more present and understand that you know, whatever we say, whatever we do, it's, it's going to come back at us. So if we put out positivity and compassion and kindness, even in the face of aggression, it does disarm people. Yeah, you know when you when people shout at you, scream at you, call you a, a militant vegan, you're crazy, you're you're a cult leader. <laughs> you know they want you to react. They want you to yeah. go f, f you and you this and that. But when you go, that's great, but that's just not the truth. You know, well, well thank you for your opinion, but that's just not how it is. Yeah, you know. People don't know how to react to that. They know how to fight fire with fire, but when yeah. you show them a bit of uh, you know that other side they don't know how to but respond. you know why i respond like that because i know what we're doing is is right okay. i have no doubts about yeah. what we're doing is positive if i was doubtful about what we're doing if i was doubtful about our movement the way we eat the way we live i probably would react with anger mm -hmm. because i would be doubting myself mm -hmm. because i am so sure that this is the future of humanity the way we eat and live people can call me whatever they want they can scream and shout and mm -hmm. be abusive but it's never going to make me angry so you co-founded uh, Plant Based News 2017 with uh, Klaus. Now, since then, your platforms have grown very... Ex they're, they're huge. They're really big now. So you're hyper-exposed mm. to the vegan community, yeah. all different aspects of the oh, vegan yeah. community. So what are the type of dynamics you're exposed to? And how do you deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis consistently? Mm. You're celebrating three years now mm. of being out yeah. there online. And how do you deal with these struggles? Like, What are you exposed to? Let us know. Where to begin? I mean, yeah. there's so many, like yourself, so many ways in which people can be positive mm -hmm. and there's so many ways in which people can be negative. So many ways people can lift you up and so many ways people can try and tear you down. Yeah. They want to see you succeed, these people, and these people want to see you fail. Wow. And no matter mm -hmm. how you frame it, there's always going to be someone who likes what you're doing and someone who wants to shit on what you're doing. Yeah. And I have to come to like terms with that and be okay with that. And that's all I have to do, really. Uh, and it's a daily struggle. Because it's there's always some new, <clears throat> some new challenge, some new person coming along, and saying something that's hurtful or wrong or or just a lie, you know, or someone who's criticizing us. So, it's a it's a case by case thing, you know. Some things I, I, I let them, I brush them off. Other things, I'm a bit more kind of, I think about them. Yeah. Because I do take criticism on board. I don't. I'm not one of these kind of people who just has my fingers in my ear, just doing whatever I want, but not listening. 
I see. So constructive criticism you take on board, but you yeah. learn to sort of distinguish, determine what's constructive and what's right. just an attack. <laughs> yeah, there's a culture, people are referring to it as call-out culture or okay. cancel culture, mm-hmm. where advocates or campaigners or people online are attacking other people within their communities. And that could be any community, mm-hmm. the non-binary community, the gay community, the vegan community, the Buddhist community, Christian, whatever. People are using social media to publicly um, lynch others. Yeah. Rather than having a call or sitting down for a meal or having a cup of tea and saying, what you're doing I think is damaging and here's the reasons why, or what your tactics you've employed here I personally think could be improved by X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But instead of doing that, instead of having like heart-to-hearts with people or meaningful value-creating dialogue, people jump straight on social media and they go for the jugular and they tear people down and then they have all their friends who agree with them join on board and it becomes like a lynch mob. Regardless of who's right or wrong, I don't think that that's healthy for any community. Very, very... uh... Uh, that's I definitely been a, been on the other end of that, but I, I do think that part of my vegan activism I've done a bit of calling out too of people yeah. who've been abusing animals and that's that's a part of my activism I guess. Um, if I see someone abusing, uh, you know, a cow in a in a dairy, I'm calling them straight out. Um, so at what point do we, you know, like if you've at what point does reaching out not work and then what do you do like I mean I understand within your own community where you've all got the same goal like in the vegan community we've all got the same goal calling out other vegan activists that tactic's not going to work that strategy's not good Um, at what point you know does reaching out to someone if that doesn't work then what do you do because it's all about your intention yeah when you call out person A, B or C what do you hope to achieve by that and do you feel that you're calling them out whether it's you and a farmer in a field or you and a person online Mm -hmm. Do you really believe that what you're going to say is going to change their opinion, change their view, or stop them doing what they're going to do? Yeah. If it's none of those things, why do it at all? I see. But if you're doing it because you're doing it as part of the campaign in the sense of, for example, if you're calling out farmers' particular tactic, not tactics, but treatments of animals, yeah. you don't really care, or you do care. You're not really that, you know that the farmer's not going to stop what they're doing. Mm. But by being public about your criticism of how they treat animals, Others are watching and observing and the way you skillfully um, explain why it's problematic, you are putting on, um, I wouldn't say a show, but you're putting on, you're, you're explaining, you're taking your audience through why what they're doing is wrong. But it's not really calling out. No, it? it's more, it's not a personal attack. It's more no, an attack on the industry. It's like, right. hey, this is cruel and abusive. This I'll industry has example. to stop. If yeah. you were like, you fat, old, bastard of a farmer, you, this and that, you used all these like, um, personal attacks you these these um what's it called um pejorative terms yeah of a person their, their personality yeah that's what you know that's what a lot of people do they sort of like lynch people they yeah. don't focus on what the person's doing wrong explain why it's a problem yeah they they they, they bully people it's a lot yeah. of it's connected to bullying i don't wouldn't say that you bully people no yeah and i generally know that farmers are a victim of the system as well not yeah. as victimized as animals but i know they are a victim yeah. on some level too um but yeah, within communities, I see it a lot too. And uh, I, I guess you're right. It is about your intention. Is your intention just because like plant-based news is a really big platform? Why do they get all this, you know, attention? And do we have to bring them down. We have to yeah. throw stones at them, yeah. you know. Um, it, you know, so I guess it is about, you know, what they hope to achieve by. Do they just want to make themselves feel better by bringing someone else down? Or do they really want to, you know, reach out to you and say, hey, I think this is a problem? Yeah. There's been people who've reached out to us about stuff all the time and yeah. we've evaluated it or removed it or changed it or Consider altered that. it. You know, we're reasonable people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not perfect. We've right. been doing this three years. I've not been in the business of publishing for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. We're learning as we go. That doesn't mean that, you know, we're saying don't criticize us. People are welcome to criticize us. Wow. But what are you trying to achieve in the community when you are basically like lynching people for some of the most ridiculous things like the issues that people raise are important like whether it's racism or or like human trafficking or 
speciesism or whatever, all these issues are important. Yeah, of course. But it's how you deliver the message. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And and we're all flawed as human beings. Like, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm learning as I go with vegan activism. <laughs> you know, I'm just going yeah. for it with all my heart. Yeah. Sometimes I'm going to say something, oh, well, maybe yeah. I could have said that better or whatever. Yeah. But how many how many articles have you written? Over 6,000 now, is it? Yeah, over 6,000. Over 6,000. Yeah. Not me personally, but yeah. But, you know, the, the plant-based news as a resource, yeah. over 6,000. There's going to be one or two that you might not yeah. personally agree with, you know? Yeah. So. You, but for the most part, you, the overall good of what you're doing, um, you know, supersedes, and it's always with good intention what you're trying to put out there. So, yeah, it's a it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all trying our best. We all want we all want to create the same change. We're all mm. working towards the, the same goal. We all have different ideas and strategies of how to get there, mm. and we're all working together. Now, let's talk about strategy because. You guys have a more, you know, you're plant-based news, yeah. aren't you? So you, you're, you're the, your approach is a lot different. You talk more about the health and the environment. You, you, I know the animals are very close to your heart, Robbie, but you're not really an animal rights, right. uh, outwardly animal rights no. uh, sort of a platform. Mm. So what do you think about different strategies and, you know, people going onto farms and rescuing animals, showing that? What do you think about these, you know, more radical forms of activism? It's a good question, and it's obviously there's not a simple answer. Depending on who you talk to, everyone's got a different opinion. Yeah. Um, firstly, the first point about plant-based news: we're plant-based news, not vegan news, because we want to be a broad-reaching platform that yeah. reaches everyone, including vegetarians, flexitarians, everyone who's just a little bit interested in cutting animal products out of their diet, because we want to get into their minds and get them to question their life, their food choices. Wow. Because I believe that if you start off with animal rights straight away, it does scare a lot of people off for the, for the most part. Not everyone cares about animals. In fact, a lot of people don't. They don't yeah. care about what happens to animals. They just want to eat their steak. And they don't care if the cow suffers or not. You know, they tell themselves these little stories about how, not, how animals live happy lives and they're happy to eat, their, eat them. Um, but I think there's different tactics, aren't there? Everyone has a different style. And often what people say is we need all of them together to bring change. Um, and I think people are doing different things because they believe in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not everyone has the skills required to, to do run a media company or to do video editing or to, be, to run a podcast or to be a, a campaigner on YouTube or, or a direct action activist. Mm-hmm. Um, it's difficult because I don't want to give any strong opinions about any one particular tactic because I think they all have their positives and they have their negatives, right? Of course, yeah. My very clear opinion about things like rescuing individual animals from farms is it's it's kind of a bit bipolar i'm 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 trying to formulate my words there's this there's this old story about a guy it's like a parable about a guy walking along the beach and there's starfish all along the beach and they're probably going to die if they stay on the beach and he's walking along with his friend and he's picking one up and he's throwing it in the ocean and picking one up and not throwing it in the ocean and his friend says why are you doing that why are you wasting your time and he says well makes a difference to this one Wow. And this one, and this one, and this one, you know, and he's saving those lives. You know, starfish are not like, they don't have eyes and faces, but they are still living entities mm-hmm. that may experience some kind of suffering. Mm-hmm. And the animals that are trapped in these horrific factory farms are still suffering as individuals. There are billions of them. Yeah. It's a tsunami of suffering. Yeah. And I feel like people that go into farms and rescue individual animals, it's a bit like standing in a, a snowstorm trying to capture one snowflake at a time and, sa- and save one snowflake at a time. Each snowflake is important. Each snowflake is beautiful. Each snowflake is unique. Mm-hmm. But it's not dealing with the problem. Mm-hmm. The tsunami of suffering that's coming at us every single day is coming at us because of the consumer. Mm-hmm. Not the farmers, not the factory farms. They're just a product of a choice in a supermarket. Yeah. Every single time a person reaches out for a box of milk or a bag of pork or a bag of mince or a steak, that karma, that choice puts those animals on that farm. Mm-hmm. When that, those choices change, those farms disappear. So I feel like with the people that go into farms that save those, one, those animals here and there, yes, of course, it makes a huge difference to that animal, that, that individual, that life that sentient being gets to go and live a life free of suffering. But for the trillions of other animals coming down, so you say one pig, 25,000 other pigs are coming down the chute behind it Mm -hmm. because of the choices of consumers in the supermarket. So I think that personally, when it comes to like what's effective, 
I personally feel that all our energy should be focused on the consumer. Change the consumers, change society, yeah. everything else disappears. Slaughterhouses disappear, dairy farms disappear, factory farms disappear. Yeah. But it's a long and painful process because there are 7.4 billion people on this planet. 99% yep. of them are eating animals. Wow. So That's huge. How the fuck... Can I swear? <laughs> yeah. How the fuck can we change the opinions and hearts and minds of all those people? And that's what I'm trying to do with plant-based news. So the problem is the consciousness of the consumer yes. and their choices. And that's what's putting these animals in these farms. Yeah. And, you know, these activists that are going in to rescue these individual animals are doing it so that this, you know, have the goodness of their heart yeah, to, to of for this one individual. Yeah. But let's throw this into the mix. A lot of these direct action rescues are happening with a barrage of advocacy afterwards. Yes, so they're yeah. taking these animals out, they're posting yeah. it online, they're posting the images of the victims online, they're rescuing them, giving this rescue story saying, look at the victims of your food choices. Yeah. Meet the victims is a good example of that. Yeah. It's getting news up and people are, you know, it's, it's creating all this controversy yeah. in the newspapers. We're coming up and we're talking about it in our videos, on our posts. Yeah. I think that outward outreach... Yeah. That can it can that's shock where the, the power is. That's where the power is. Yeah. yeah. So it's not necessarily obviously for those individuals you're saving. It's great for them. Mm. But the power is in influence. Of course. Influencing people to make those changes, and as and as long as we're always conscious of that. Same with the save movement. People say, well, you know, I've been on many saves, and people have said to me, um, save save move. Why is it called the save movement? We're not saving any animals. You know, but the process is is that you're going to experience what animals experience in the final, final moments of their life. For most humans, for most people who live in Western society, they've never seen that before. Yeah. They've never experienced that process. Mm -hmm. And it's quite shocking for a lot of people because they see the individuals, they see the eyes of the animals, they see the fear, and so they feel something. And then they go away and tell their friends and family, they might capture video. Yeah. That's where the power is. That's the influence that needs to go on. For me, as long as that's going on, then that's being effective. Yeah. But if you go into these farms and you take an animal and you naively take them home and try and sort of look after them like a pet or a companion animal, there's a lot of people who are quite naive about it. They don't really understand that they're taking from a system that believes that that animal is a piece of property mm -hmm. and not an individual. Yeah. So I guess uh, if you're going to do any type of activism, I, I would say off the back of it, do some advocacy too. So you have you, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're helping deal with the problem and not just put a band-aid on the problem, you know? It's like it's like you're in a bath filling with sand and all you've got to, to empty it is a teaspoon. Yeah. And it's filling up. Yeah. And that's what the world is today. Like, you know, we're, we're it's relentless. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's with uh, with plant-based news, you're trying everything to reach the mainstream. And, and Yeah, and we that. want to have a mainstream conversation around why we don't need to eat animals. Yes, animals are suffering. But that's a byproduct of people's choices. Mm -hmm. But if we can convince people to cut animals out of their diet because it's better for our health and it's better for the environment, mm -hmm. it deals with the animal suffering because we, we, we convince people we no longer need to consume them. Wow. So I guess with this, uh, this softer, more broader approach, um, you, you're trying not to alienate those who have never heard of this yeah. and you're trying to reach, you know, softly, softly. Like, like let's just, me for example, I started doing juice fasting first, you know, and then this guy, was this hippie guy, Dan McDonald, the life <laughs> regenerator, he was talking about, you know, karma, man, and all this stuff. And I, and that's how I sort of started to wake up. Mm. You know, I didn't see an animal rights. It's weird. I became an animal rights activist from this. Mm. He wasn't even a vegan. Mm. This, this juice fasting guy. Mm. So it's, it's weird how the progression can happen. And, I, and that's why I, I don't, you know, shun you know, this, these are different approaches that are trying their best to reach people with different approaches. Yeah, everyone's trying their best. That's the thing. I obviously always caveat what I'm saying when I offer my opinions mm -hmm. on tactics. Mm -hmm. Everyone's doing their best and trying their best to stem what is, I say, the tsunami of suffering. You know, everyone's just using the skills or the resources or the courage they have because it takes a lot of guts to do direct action. Of course. It's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah. And, and what do you think about other social justice movements always having some type of direct action mm -hmm. um, to, to force social change or to force the conversation yeah. into the mainstream? Again, for me, there's a lot of nuance here. So people often talk about direct action. Take the take this um, uh, justice for, for, for um, black rights, say, in mm -hmm. the US. People would go and sit in restaurants, wouldn't yeah. they, and kind of like protest inside restaurants and do sit-ins and do all kinds of things and get really get up in people's faces um 
it's really, really tricky because you want to, you know, sometimes it's hard to compare speciesism with racism. They are related, they're interconnected, aren't they? Mm. The victims are different. Yeah. We often have to say it's very important to remember that the victims are different. Yeah. But the but the mechanisms in which people talk about individuals, some are m- more important than others. Dogs, cats, um, are are loved, whereas chickens and cows and pigs have no rights and they're just food. Yeah. You know, like with in, with racism, you know, in the in the U.S. or worldwide, you know, this this color or race of people are important and have privilege, and this these people don't. When in fact they're both human beings and they both deserve. To have the same rights, you know, and how do we how do we convince people to listen? Do we use violence? Do we attack people? Do we do we try and educate people? It's really difficult because we don't want people to suffer. We don't want anyone to die. We don't want to have to use violence. Yeah. My personal opinion is that we have to start. We have to focus on our children. We have to focus on the younger generations. Yeah. And and try and educate and teach young people about compassion, about kindness. You know, and teach people to be. To be good, Te- happy, kind people don't attack each other, yeah. and compassionate people don't want to attack each other. There, I think that innate compassion, when it's fostered within human beings, I think it, it automatically all the all the other kind of isms do melt away. I think. Wow. I, yeah. I, I, I tend to agree that it does sort of the roots of it start at your childhood. Hey, yeah. like you know, if you if your child is around a lot of abuse, a lot of discrimination, and they see, you know, dad treating mum unfairly, and, mm. you know, your parents are racist, or they, yeah. they instill hatred into you, or, or, or like, oh, look at that animal there, it's just a filthy pig, and mm. all these uh, things that you learn, you just absorb as yeah. a child, and if we... And, and I also f- find this phenomenon with, you know, doing outreach that the younger generation are just easier to reach mm. um, than, you know, the cup that's completely full yeah. <laughs> won't take yeah. in anything new. Yeah. Mm. It is hard. It's hard to convince older people to listen because they feel like they've lived their lives and you come along as a younger person. They're like, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? Yeah. That's why it's harder for kids to get their families to go vegan because yeah. they come to this lifestyle and they realize it's a... It's a compassionate kind of healthier lifestyle yeah. and they go and tell their parents and their parents are they don't want to listen yeah. because they think you know who are you little boy to tell me what to do <laughs> yeah i i totally agree with that i just I, I love talking to the 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 teenage uh like women the younger women they're more con- connected to empathy guys i don't know what's going on with the guys they're just they've been trained differently or something they're just really mm. you know they've got these barriers up there's so much stigma with men experience like trying to outwardly express emotion mm. and me being from you know gangs and hardened you know people from prisons and things like that like men are really you know they've got this barrier with yeah. you robbie like i've noticed you're very connected to your emotion you're very outwardly like when when if you have anyone ever meets robbie you'll see he's really warm really uh, you know yielding I'm really. I was really closed off. But what is this phenomenon? Do you think it's like cultural? It's fathers. What is it? It's a defense mechanism. Yeah. You've you've obviously everything that you've experienced as a person. You've had to protect yourself mm. emotionally, physically, spiritually. Um, I was very lucky to grow up in a in a world where I was. I have been able to grow up in a world where I've been able to, like, develop myself, self actualization. Yeah. You know, I've not needed to worry about over the last twenty two years. I've not really had to worry too much about survival, about food. I've been fortunate to live in a part of the world where I can focus on myself and develop myself as a person. But when you're just trying to survive and dodge bullets or knives or whatever, yeah. you don't have time to for self actualization. You don't have time to, you know, meditate and try and figure out who you are. And I think that's what it is. I think a lot of people are so busy just trying to live their lives, just trying to survive, and men are particularly socialized to not have time for emotion. It's mm-hmm. just about being the breadwinner and about being the one who is, uh, you know, the patriarch. Mm-hmm. This is the society we live in where yeah. men are kind of pushed to be the leaders. And, you know, obviously our world is changing. You know, the, 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 the scales of privilege and, and opportunity are, are, are leveling out. Yeah. This is why the world is in such flux because everything is now changing. Mm-hmm. The world that was is no longer the world that is now. Yeah, you know, and then that's why everything is upside down. <laughs> yeah, for a good reason. <laughs> it, it is. It is good. It is good. Um, I've always hated like the fact that you know it's hard to talk about emotions with other men and like, and I think like 
it leads to like suicide because you, you're yes, bottling all this stuff it's up. It's the leading killer of men in the UK. Yeah. 5,800 men take their lives every single year in this country. It's the leading killer of men under 55. Oh my God. Yeah. I didn't know suicide. that. Suicide. Yeah. And that's because they just haven't learned to express emotions. You know, I didn't even know what certain emotions were. Like, what am I feeling here? I didn't, had never been taught, mm. you know, what these emotions we are. You're not allowed to because yeah. that's not what boys do, right? No, you toughen up. You know, and that's the society we live in where men and women are forced into these polar opposites when we're not. Human beings are human beings. Men are obviously more prone to certain characteristics. Yeah. You know, top-level characteristics. But I think... Yeah, men and women are equally capable of experiencing extreme and deep emotions. Yeah. Sorrow and sadness and joy and all that. So we're looking at the vegan movement, 75% around uh, women. And I would say more, I'd say 80 plus. Wow. Yeah. Wow, it's no surprise really to me. Um, men have always been the hardest to receive this message. We've got a, a lot of compassionate men out there. I'm not, not trying to downplay the men in the movement, but it just seems like this message is received better yeah. by emotionally connected women. It is, yeah. And... Um, what do you think about this as a strategy for outreach to focus on those who are easier to reach like the women <laughs> instead of like banging your head against the wall against you know, the, you know I know that everyone needs to be reached but why not reach those who are easier first yeah low hanging fruit yeah <laughs> not yep. to call women low hanging fruit <laughs> but women are more open they are you know women are socialised to, to, to connect and they have better French, like closer friendship groups and from a very young age women are more um, it's so, I think in our society more encouraged to, to, to connect and to, mm. to express themselves um, but you know with things like the game changers coming out the recent film yeah. when content and documentaries or art or whatever you want to call it is geared in a way that men get and taps into their ego for example yeah. like in the game changers there's a bit where they talk about erections yeah. and saying how you know if you switch to a plant based diet you can potentially increase your the strength of your erections <laughs> by strong erections 500% <laughs> You know, a lot of men, like, they care about stuff like that. Yeah. They want to be sexually uh, powerful and strong. Mm -hmm. No man wants to be have his sexual identity reduced. Yeah. You know, and so when you tap into sort of the ego uh, of, of men, I feel like it's a very powerful way to get men to listen. It's a ticket in. It is. Isn't it? Um, yeah. I know that we should be doing all of this for the right reasons, which is sure. to protect yeah. animals from being abused. But um, I, I guess everything is a ticket in. And once you find what that ticket is for someone, once they sort of yield to this message, they get off the meat and dairy and they're more open to it, that's when they can really solidify and find earthlings or find the ethical, mm. um, you know, this horror show that's going on. That you know, So everyone needs their ticket in. And that's why plant-based news is so fantastic because it reaches your arms out in all these different ways. Yeah, it's crazy. This last month, we reached 29 million people on social media. That is one month. amazing. That's crazy. And, and everything is growing so rapidly. Like our Instagram just hit 500,000 wow. followers and it's going up about 3,000 a day. Amazing. Um, you know, and the website is, which, you know, gets about five, five million page impressions a month. So, you're doing something right there. We must be doing something right. People Do want to read our content. You know, so to all the vegans who think that we're not vegan enough, we do have a strategy and we are we're not forgetting about the animals. So no. we don't people who think that we don't write enough about animal stuff, we're trying to be strategic. We're trying to build a big audience first, get everyone on board and then I mean, we we already do. We we we, we craftily stealthily put in the animal message so that it's yeah. there. So that people are not kind of blindsided by it. So they're, they're learning about health and nutrition. And then the animal message comes in and they're like, yeah, they but, take it in. The barrier is down. Yeah. Yeah. That, that totally makes sense. More of a strategy. See me, I can't talk about anything else really. I have been in, in sort of introducing different aspects of advocacy, training, being an athlete, those types of things. Um, but people can share my stuff. But I think the strategy is really working like wonders for developing a following, pulling people's barriers down, interweaving the animal rights stuff. You share animal rights activist stuff too. I mean, it's it's fantastic. So where to from here? Do you have, looking forward, like with, with how far you've come now, like where do you see yourself in five years? Do you have, do you, do you just follow your heart or do you have a plan? The plan is to build a platform that reaches more people and we're yep. going to do that through continually creating more content in the three areas which is health nutrition 
sorry, health, animal ethics, and environment. Yeah. And then underneath that is all the other areas, whether it's fashion or technology or science or food technology, just to kind of be there telling all those stories. But then also I want to develop the whole education side of things as well. Really want to make courses. I mean, we already have. So we've got PBN Academy where you can learn on how to have a successful vegan pregnancy, mm -hmm. raise a child uh, vegan. Um, we've also got reversing type 2 diabetes on a plant-based diet. So we've got these short courses where we teach people about these topics. Yeah. So I want to develop that as well. So I think knowledge is power, as they say. We really want to empower people with the knowledge because I think people go and stay vegan when they really feel confident about what they're doing. Yeah. People leave the vegan community or switch away from the vegan diet when they're doubtful, when they get ill and they feel like it's their, their diet that's the cause and they don't realize there's a whole lot of stress in their life probably causing it. Yeah. But when people feel confident about what they're doing, but then also be aware of what is involved in animal agriculture and just the sheer horror of it. Yeah. But also the damage as well. Like, is, it, is that steak really worth it? Yes, it tastes great and you enjoy it for like, you know, an hour or so, but the damage it's doing to our world, is it really, really worth it? Helping people really get that and making sure it goes in, it's just not worth it. Mm. And as long as we're out there educating people about that, that's, I feel like we're doing our job. Yeah, amazing. And what about on a personal level? Do, um, do you feel like, you know, are you just always going to operate with plant-based news or are you going to do anything in your own personal ventures? Because I see there's a lot of, you've got so many levels to you as a human being and so much to give. Are you thinking about doing anything just off the back of your, you know, off your own personal mm. um, platform? or? Mm. I'd like to. I'd like to do more public speaking. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get involved with kind of writing books and things, like physical things people can use to learn yeah. and develop. It's difficult because I'm someone who likes to get involved in lots of different things. So it's hard for me to like focus my energy into one space. Yeah. Um, because I, I enjoy so many different parts of what we do. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it would be probably getting involved with more documentary type content. Yeah, I really have this burning desire to make documentaries, you know, feature length documentaries on particular topics. Gender, for example. Wow. We're living in the middle of a gender revolution where people are starting to realize that gender is not a binary, even though there are a lot of people, more conservative people, who refuse to, to listen and say, no, you know, gender is about men and women and that's it. There's no one in between. You know, I categorically disagree with that. Because my entire life, I've always felt a little bit different. Not completely male, not female, somewhere in the middle. And I never had a way to talk about it, a way to describe it. You yeah. know, and this whole gender revolution has expanded and it's developing and it's evolving. And it's such an interesting conversation. It's fascinating. But there's so many people on either side of the conversation who want to shut it down and don't want to talk about it. So I want to explore stuff like that. To talk about your sexuality, Robbie. I mean, we yeah. haven't talked about that. I mean... Uh, if you're comfortable yeah, with that of and have you experienced any bullying because of it how, how early did you find out about your sexuality tell everyone about that yeah so I grew up in Zimbabwe which is in Africa yeah um, and being gay in Zimbabwe is considered a crime you actually go to prison oh my god you get a 15 year sentence if you're caught in a gay relationship in, in that part of the world so it's considered a crime so that rhetoric or that dogma was around me as a child and I lived in fear because I didn't know any other gay people. I didn't even know what being gay was, right? And you, your sexuality, just with heterosexuality, you, you, you discover it, you know, in your, in your you know, young, in your young years, well, you know, before you're yeah. like nine or ten, I guess, eight, nine, ten, you start to notice the other gender or the same gender, so right at the same time. So I think, you know, gay children and heterosexual children develop their sexuality around the same time. Okay. So it's pretty much identical. But it was weird because there was no one to support me, no one to talk to me about it, no one to explain to me what I was going through, why I was different, mm. no one to nourish me and nurture me, only fear and shame. So it was a terrifying experience as a child, growing up feeling like I was an alien or that I was some kind of like abomination because I grew up in a religious part of the world which is very heavily Christian, which taught that being gay was an abomination, that you go to hell and that God hated you and that being gay was a sin. But I didn't even know what gay was, but I knew that I was one of these people, potentially. And I lived in terror from the age of, like, till I was from eight till I, you know, left home. How Terrified old? that my family would find out about it. And when I was about 15, I said to my mum, 
Um, we were driving, I remember the day, like, like it was yesterday, I said to my mum, what would you do if I told you I was gay? We were driving to school and she said, oh, I'd probably kill myself. Oh my God. How awful. So Is that the first time you'd ever nearly confided yeah, to someone about it? Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine as a teenager when you tell the, the most important person in your life that you might be gay and then she responds with that. And she is like, my, my mum was my world, my world. And I was, that I was like, right, that's it. I'm never telling anyone this. I'll keep this hidden forever. <laughs> and then I, and then, you know, I moved out and moved to the big city and, you know, I dated girls like a lot of gay, pe- gay, pe- gay men do in the beginning. And I just hid it. And then um, I happened, happened to have an experience where, you know, I had an experience and, and I had a girlfriend at the time and she found out um, and she went straight to my parents and told my parents. Oh, wow. And uh, I was out. Wait for them to find out, eh? And yeah, I was out by my parents. <laughs> Amazingly, they both responded very well. My mum cried, my dad cried. They're both upset. They blamed themselves, but they weren't, like, they didn't throw me out. A lot of young gay people are thrown out. How old were you at this time? About 16. Oh, wow. 17, okay. yeah. So it was only a couple of years later. But, um... My um, parents responded well, and you know they they are very accepting, and they're always asking me now when I'm going to get married. I've been with my partner now for eleven years. Oh my god, yeah. amazing! Um, so, um, how long did it take for you to become comfortable with your sexuality outwardly? I'm still not completely comfortable with it. Oh my god! Because of yeah. years of like living in a in a society where I was told what I was was an abomination or wrong. Lewis and I. We don't hold hands in public because I'm I'm I live, I'm in, I live in fear. I mean, you can't live comfortably in a society where you're not seen as normal because heterosexuality is seen as normal, even though in nature you know homosexuality is quite common. Um, yeah. So so I live in that. I live I live with that all the time. So I would say never really. It's, it's been very hard. Yeah, that's abs- That's awful. I've never I've never heard that from the experience of another gay person or of a, of a gay person, like what it's like to like not be able to express yourself to your partner in public or like, do you think society has come a, a long way or is it still really in the stone ages when it it's comes still to still in the stone ages. Wow. You know, well, I can't walk down the high street in Whitechapel, hand in hand, I'll probably get have something thrown at me, you know. Um, we have acceptance in, in, in most parts of society, in modern British society, you yeah. can get married and stuff. There's still in like hate crimes in this country are at an all time high towards LGBT people. So absolutely awful, and um, I, I've never seen anything like that myself. But if I saw something like that, I'd definitely be speaking out about it. And you know, it's just um, I, I it's hard for me to to understand. I've always been very accepting of people, but I understand because of the where I come from. Yeah. You know, the gang culture and all that. Yeah. Like in prison, it's just not accepted. Yeah, it's just not accepted. I, I thought it was more you know, the world that I'm from, it's not accepted, but it seems like just society hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. I mean, there's a long way to go. You know. um, gay rights and the, the fighting for the rights of LGBT people hasn't really been going on that long. If 40 years ago, it was illegal in this country to be in a gay relationship. Alan Turing, who was one of the heroes of the Second World War, who, who uh, cracked the Enigma Code and, and ended the, sec- the, German, the World War against the Germans, he was a national hero, but he was gay, and he was in a relationship with a man, and it was and it was exposed. And instead of um, kind of like pretend, you know, the government sort of washing it away, he had two choices: he could either go to prison, or he could be chemically castrated. The government chemically castrated a national hero because he was gay, because being gay and sodomy, as it was called in the UK, you know, two men having sex was a crime. Only forty years ago. Wow, my mind is blown. I don't know anything about gay history and yeah, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. Um, and have you ever been bullied for your sexuality? Yeah, I mean, I think you know over the years there's been people who've reacted negatively. Yeah, but on on a whole, if I take a step back, you know, I've always been completely fine. And and, and what I love about the gay gay community, the vegan community, yeah, is that all the men that I know in the vegan community. Because the, the women are fine usually. I've never had any issues with women. But all the men, the straight men in the vegan community are completely open and loving. And my sexuality isn't even an issue. They don't even no. think about it. So No. I mean, I've always noticed you're just the more compassionate in human being. Just more, I don't know, just more connected to your emotions. Has that got anything to do with your sexuality or more to do with your spiritual sort of 
uh, Buddhism and no, I think it's to do with more spirituality. Yeah. There's a lot of very angry gay men yeah. who are very um, hurt and damaged by the society. That understand that. I uh, completely understand that. I mean, yeah. completely understand that. It's kind of, it's kind of similar to not not on the same level, but it's similar to what you know vegan activists would experience. You know, constant ridicule. Yeah. And, but I wouldn't say it's on the same level. Mm. Um, but that's why a lot of vegan activists are angry because they're constantly yeah. defending and fighting and. Yeah. And let's talk about this non-binary thing because I'm completely new to it. Like you're yeah. talking to someone who doesn't know anything about this whatsoever. And would you consider yourself non-binary? Like you don't you don't identify as male or female? Well, it's diff- labels are interesting things, aren't yeah. they? You know, I don't want to label myself because as soon as you label yourself, you put yourself in a box. True. And you say you're with these people, yeah, or these people, or this group of people. So I, I, I'd be cautious. I'd be kind of cautious to say I'm non-binary because I don't want to pigeonhole myself but I certainly as I've grown and I've explored the idea of what gender means I feel like I am somewhere in the middle I don't feel like being a woman but I don't feel like I'm a man either because I think a lot of people don't understand that what you're born with like your sex you know your sex organs whether you've got ovaries or testes or penis or or vagina or whatever that's your sex that's your body yeah but then gender is your identity that's something beyond your physical body it's who you see yourself to be. How you see yourself. For example, if you walk down the street, White Chapel High Street in a dress, how would you feel? I'd feel definitely out of place. Why? Because I identify as a, a man, so I dress like a man and I put weird but why, trousers. But a and... dress is just a piece of fabric. Exactly. So why would you feel weird about it? Yeah. Well, because of um, the way other people would view that. Right. And, and, I, and I would feel uncomfortable. So with what that is too. identity? It's how others perceive you and how you perceive yourself. Yeah. Wow, wow, that blew my mind a bit then. <laughs> so, so when you take on a dress or a wig or, or makeup or whatever, you're altering your outward identity and yeah. how you present yourself. Now, I present as a man, beard, yeah. deeper voice, trousers or whatever. But if I came in tomorrow and I was in a dress and makeup and I shaved off my beard and I looked more feminine, I'd be presenting as a female, I get it. as feminine. Yeah. But I'm still, a, I'm born a man and my sex is male, but my gender would be moving more towards female because I would be looking female, dressing female, maybe, you know, in a more feminine way because the gender is, is what society has defined it as. You feel uncomfortable wearing a dress down Whitechapel High Street because society has defined wearing a dress as a thing women do only. Yeah. Unless you're in Scotland and you wear kilt. <laughs> <laughs> I am part Scottish, so you never know. <laughs> wow, that's really blown my mind. So because you don't you don't present yourself as an eccentric gay man, you no. know, like a lot of gay men they're really eccentric yeah. and you can really tell, but yeah. you just seem, you know, just like a normal guy and even you know, your partner seem you just yeah. seem like two normal guys. But again, that's all identity. So you yeah. can like what you're talking about is sort of being camp or being effeminate yeah. and kind of like theatrical. Yeah. A lot of gay men love to put on that show because it's fun. Yeah. It's fun to be able to express yourself and wave your hands around and yeah. sing and dance and be a theatrical person in a, in, a, in a healthy society. Be proud as well. That would yeah. be encouraged and, and, and nurtured. Yeah. Because a lot of those people are very creative, they're talented and artistic. Yeah. But in a society where it says, no, men don't behave like that. You're a little sissy. Yeah. You're a little pufta, as you might say in South Africa or a, what do you say in Australia? There's all sorts of slurs. Uh, not South African, Australia. There's all sorts of, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There is a lot. Uh, you know, every Western country seems to have all these. People call words. me it for being a vegan activist. They right. use gay slurs on me yeah. for caring about no, animals. So and... people associate being gay with something so negative. Mm. People use the word gay as an insult yeah. to try and tear people down because as if, because being gay is, do you want, do you want to know where homos, uh, homophobia comes from though? It's really interesting. Where? It comes from sexism. Because for a man to be like a woman is degrading. Because for a man to be anything feminine or female is degrading. Because, you know, men aren't like women. Why? Because men are better than women. We're physically more superior or something like that. If we had no sexism in our society, homophobia wouldn't exist. Wow. Because men are so terrified of being anything feminine because they don't want to be seen as weak or passive or under the power of another man. 
For, for a man to be under another man is considered degrading because of the way men view women, because of our, the way our society sees women. That is messed up. And women are some, the, the women in the movement, some of the strongest exactly. people I've ever met. They're but so protective. That's why sexism is so ridiculous, because it's men's innate fear of being female or being anything close to being female or feminine. But we all have a feminine and masculine aspect to us. It's all in different ratios yes. that is so true because like if someone were to call you a pig or a cow or you're a chicken like you take that as an insult but i love pigs and i don't if, yeah. someone, if you know someone called me a pig I, I don't get insulted anymore because i i've sort of trained that species is out of my yeah. mind but people use pig as an insult and i guess this is kind of like the same sort of discrimination like yeah. being considered feminine is well, like, run like a girl you run like a girl you, you cry like a girl. Some Olympians of women. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. In our society, we treat and talk about women in a really demeaning way. I mean, it's built into our language. I really, I do agree with you. And that's, I, I've just learned a whole lot just then. And I'm really glad we had this conversation. And I think that you, you're, you're really spot on when we have got a long way to go when it comes to just education and being conscious about these different forms of discrimination that are just in, in built into us and the way society is structured, you know? Like, yeah, you can't just walk around with a dress on, you know? You, people are going to laugh at you. People are probably going to throw something at yeah. you. I'd feel embarrassed and it's like, why? It's just a bit of fabric. It's why? just, you know? But, yeah, and, and um, I really am grateful for you to be, you know, to have the confidence to share this about yourself and, you know, it just it makes me admire you so much more that you have the strength to you know, overcome such adversity in this world. And, and it's, it's, it's like, a, it's oppression, isn't it? Like, especially where you were born in Zimbabwe, you were born in Africa, yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's oppression and it's so new and it's only just started to legally been, been dealt with. Mm -hmm. and But still in people's consciousness, it's mm -hmm. still, we're so far behind. Mm -hmm. And you still managed to, you know, do all the fantastic work you do for animals. And has being a victim in, in one aspect of your life helped you recognise the oppression in the, the animals as yeah, well? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think, I think understanding what it's like to be... A, not, I mean, I wouldn't say I've directly been oppressed. Obviously, I do have other areas of my identity which do give me added privilege in society. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm Caucasian. I'm, I'm, I present as male. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, 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 there's a lot of discussion around that as well. And that does give you, you know, added levels of privilege. And I, but I feel like as a man, you know... As a man who's 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 acknowledged that, recognised that, I feel like I have a duty to to uh, to use it in a positive way, not to abuse my privilege, but wow. to to um, invest it wisely. And um, who are who are least privileged in this society than those who are caged and cut up into pieces yeah. and fed to human beings? I mean, the animals are really on the the but lowest. It doesn't always, but people like you would expect all LGBT people to get it. I mean, they you would expect them to all be vegan, but they don't. A lot of gay people I've spoken to don't want to hear about veganism or don't want to talk about animals. They think it's ridiculous. And really, they're just animals. Yeah, so. You would assume that people who've understood, who understand oppression, would understand other forms of oppression. You would assume people who are vegan wouldn't be racist or sexist or transphobic, mm -hmm. but they are, and they are people like that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. When I was at the uh, the march, uh, the parade, the pride parade, I found them the most easiest to talk to about yeah. this this topic. Uh, very understanding, but you don't feel that's true of the whole community. No, I think it's you know. Every human being is different. Yeah. It really depends on their upbringing and their knowledge of of oppression um, and their introspection and their what's it called self actualization. Depends on how much inner work people have done. I think. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robbie, for enlightening me. My pleasure. And wow, well, like I really do feel like I'm, I know so much more about you. And thank you so much for your work. Um, I know it's a, it's a battle, like you're going up against it here. Your platforms are really big. You've got an amazing team behind you. Plant based news are really. If you don't know plant based news, then you probably you're more likely to know plant based news than me. <laughs> <laughs> but keep going, and thank you thank so you. much for coming on the podcast. Do you have any last words for the listeners? My final words are be kind to yourself, be kind to everyone else and just keep being a good person within the best of your abilities. That's it. Thank you so much, Robbie. My pleasure. Peace. Peace out. That was a killer podcast. I love that. Thanks, bro.
Well, talking about some new stuff, you got you got to go. After that, yeah. yeah, so do I. All right, six thirty. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, mate. And um, I'm glad we talked about that.